Professional football in America is a special game, a unique game. Played nowhere else on earth, it is a rare game. The men who play it make it so. It is a position unlike any other in professional sports. At quarterback, from Brigham Young, number eight. The men who play quarterback in the National Football League are a cut above. They are the best. Same name as a category. <sighs> Rubber wedding and marching band. Yeah, wow, that was good. And the brightest. The quarterback controls so much. I gotta go to work. And Young looking to the end zone. Touchdown, 49ers! Controls the pace, controls really the result much more than anyone else on the field. Back to throw, goes over the middle, and it's one touchdown, 49ers! You know, he went to law school. I don't think he's ever practiced law. He can do whatever he wants. I always thought he would be the governor of Utah. Rolls out to his right, looks downfield, got a run for it. He may get there! He does! Steve Young was so athletic and so difficult to defend because he was multidimensional. Steve Young's steel resolve helped him become a master of improvisation. <laughs> you can sense that things are happening despite yourself almost. Pressure from Swilling, also Jackson. Young gets out of there, and look at this guy go to the 10, 5. Young dives, he is to the one-yard line. That's unbelievable. He's averaging almost nine yards a carry, and that was a 26-yard run to the one-yard line. He was fast. He was accurate. The coverage was there. The ball had to be perfect. It was. He can run with the football. He can throw with the football. And the combination of those two talents took him to the top of the football world. He did all these exciting things that, that I, I wanted to do, and the, the way he played his game was the way I wanted to play my game. Steps up, tucks it in, runs away to his left, has some space, he's got lots of room. Certain athle athletes that have, um, I'll call it, they defy your eye. Like you see them do things, you're like, rerun that, I want to see that again. greatest play I ever saw him make, or, and one of the great offensive plays I've ever seen in my life, was a run against the Vikings. Young, back to throw. In trouble, he's going to be sacked. No, gets away. He runs, gets away again, goes to the 40, gets away again. Never say die. Steve, never say die young. It was so prototypically Steve. I used to even used to wear number eight before I started wearing number seven. So, uh, you know, Steve was my idol growing up, man. And, you know, he's done some wonderful things in his career. And it was just one of those weird things that happens when you have that ability to kind of run around that messes you up. You'll never see a quarterback make a scramble like that, maybe ever again, because nobody's as crazy as Young. I'm a Seahawk! <laughs> I ate Falcons for breakfast! <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. He was kind of a crazy man out there. And those wild eyes and screaming at his teammates. Everybody's wandering around. Let's go. But he also learned how to flawlessly execute a script. Goes for the end zone. Rice is out there. Touchdown, 49ers. Let's go, let's go, let's go. He could throw deep, and he was left-handed. Young throws downfield, Jerry Rice, he's got it! Barring major injury, you're going to see a 3,500-yard season from Steve Young. Touchdown! He was by far the highest-rated quarterback before 2000. I got to go to work! His career passer rating of 96.8 is the highest of any quarterback in NFL history. Nobody has led the league in passer rating as many times. I mean, he led it six times in seven years. Woo! He scored more touchdowns rushing than Gale Sayers. He passed for more yards than Sonny Jurgensen. Setting the league marks for most consecutive passing titles with four, as well as the highest career completion percentage and passer rating. He passed for more touchdowns than Terry Bradshaw. 
And on top of that, his quarterback rating when he retired was the highest of all time. You think Steve Young is a quarterback in the future? Yes, he is. He's great. Oh, man, he's something else. Steve Young, to me, is one of the great athletes ever to play the game. So just let it go and hope for the best. This has been a story that was one flight of stairs at a time, right? I never expected or even thought that it was possible. He could dribble a basketball around two, and most kids can't do that, and he could do push-ups. Greenwich High School, Steve went on to become co-captain of three sports his senior year while earning a 4.0 average. Although he played baseball and basketball, there was no doubt Steve was partial to pigskin. Mike Ornato was the Cardinals varsity football coach and he'll tell you without a doubt that even back in high school, Steve Young was the real deal. He was our best athlete. He could throw. He could throw pretty well despite what he says. There was despite, you know, the, 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 the rumor out there that we didn't throw in high school. I called all the plays and we called a lot of passing plays that turned into running plays, trust me. Okay. All I remember in high school years was yeah, I mean, all my teammates yelled, pitch it, pitch it. You know, I was like, nah, I don't think I'm going to pitch it. I think I'll keep it. Steve was lightning fast on his feet, and with Ornato's option offense, Steve was right at home. He could run right, run left, and he had an unbelievable ability to slip past the defense. Steve would rise to the next level sooner than he anticipated. As an All-State senior, Steve rushed for 13 touchdowns and led the Greenwich Cardinals to the county championship game. Steve's dad contends his legs got him there, but if you ask Steve, Coach Ornato had a lot to do with his early success. He was a great football coach. We had a great heritage at, at Greenwich High. And uh, I thought that was an important piece of the puzzle, too, because you've got to have a good program. Football is the ultimate team game. If you don't have a good group of guys around you, good coaching, you're not going to have a career. Because if you don't, you're not going to thrive enough to get to that next level. You need coaching. Going to college, there were not many places. Despite I was recruited a lot of places, there was only one place that I was going to feel comfortable. That's the truth. Steve wanted a legitimate shot at the quarterback spot, but that was not to be. One obstacle was quarterback great Jim McMahon. The other was something Steve didn't anticipate. We had a great quarterback coach at that time, a guy named uh, Doug Scoble. And Doug was an outstanding quarterback coach. And uh, Doug didn't think the kid could ever be a quarterback at BYU because he could never, he never drop back and threw a pass ever in his life. And the first few they'd draw back, he had to have a hard time hitting that window over there. And Doug Scoble had told me, I don't coach lefties. Okay, well that's not good because I'm not righty, you know. At the end of the season, Edwards <coughs> traditionally interviewed each player and said, you know, where are you and this is where we think you are. And, and he interviewed Steven and he said, uh, he says, you're, gonna, you're never going to play quarterback here. If you want to play for this team, you've got to switch to defensive back. Neither expectations nor a family connection did anything to buy Steve an easy ride on the BYU football team. Truth is, it would end up being a litmus test, whose outcome would predict Steve's ability to overcome tremendous obstacles in the shadow of greatness and find his own place in the sun. When I showed up on campus, no one cared. And when I replaced uh, Jim McMahon, no one really knew. You know, you'd think Steve Young, Graham Young, well, no one really cared, you know. And, and it was rough because Jim really was, at that point, had had the greatest college career of any quarterback in history. I just walked into it. And I didn't know how I was going to get through it. They put me as a scout team. And remember, I was eighth string. And so coaches just aren't focused on the eighth string quarterback. No one really knew my name, and so I was starting to feel like I should have done something else. This is not working. Oh, well, you know, I'll wing it and see how it goes. And about three weeks into it, I'd had it. I was like, this is ridiculous. I called my dad, and I said, Dad, this is, they don't even know my name. I'm getting pummeled, you know, and this is stupid. I should have gone to North Carolina. This is, you know, I'm, I, I've had, I'm coming home. I'm quitting. 
I called my dad about two weeks later. I said, Dad, I'm done. And he called up. He says, uh, Dad, this is not going good for me. He says, I want to quit and come home. And, you know, I thought to myself, I don't want this kid to, to learn how to quit. He called home and checked about it, or he just said he just wanted to quit. You know, you know that uh, you can quit. That's up to you. That's your decision now that you're 18. And his famous line is, you can quit, but you can't come home. I don't live with quitters. You can quit, but you can't come home. Because uh, uh, I don't live with quitters, he says. That is a true story. I mean, you have to psych these kids out a little bit, you know. <laughs> BYU football was the most anxiety-ridden, brutal time. Because I was young, I hadn't done this very much. That was the worst. I think that's where the distaste I had for watching started. It's like, I just, I don't want to watch. I just want to play, or I or I've got a ton of things I want to do. But Steve went back, even though he was eighth in the depth charts. That's not warming the bench, that's carving your initials on it. And I think that that was the place, BYU was the place that I knew that I could go and, and be comfortable. If he would have said, yeah, you know, they're, they're, it hasn't worked out, you know, pack your bags. My bags were already packed. Jim McMahon technically was as good a quarterback as I have ever been around. I've just been watching Jim McMahon all fall, and, and I saw how he threw the football. Jim was a, uh, he was a pure thrower, and I had learned to throw from Jim. I actually went to college and hadn't learned to throw the football. Jim would be practicing, and I would go on the sidelines and try to copy him. Finally realized, oh, he throws it like this. Very technically, very sound. I finally learned how to throw it, you know, out of my hand. I just watched Jim. And by watching him like Phil Mickelson watched his dad lefty and righty, I was the eighth string quarterback, so no one cared, but I was over on the sidelines, and I would just follow Jim, and then started throwing. I was like, oh, you throw the ball like this. And once I realized that's how you do it, not only could I throw it much harder, like 20 times harder, I could go right there. And I, and I had this new thing that happened. I'd learned to throw the football. And the funny thing is, is once I learned, I could throw it anywhere. Doug Scobo leaves for San Diego State. Ted Toner comes in, and he's got fresh eyes. He's just looking. And I'm back there at the end of practice. I'm throwing the ball. And so he goes into Lavelle and says, Lavelle, have you, what do you do with Steve yet? Oh, he's too fast. He's going to DB. Well, I was with him at BYU. We were going to Georgia. Steve threw six interceptions that day. I, I think you ought to. He's throwing the ball pretty well. You ought to see if he... No, no, he's doing that. Man, we got to fix this or I'm going to be, you know, I've got little kids and you got to take care of me here. Well, why don't you let him have two weeks? And Ted Toner begged for two weeks. He uh, uh, got those two weeks from Lavelle and the rest is history. And once I felt that feeling, changed everything. And then he led the nation in total offense. By his sophomore season, the former wishbone quarterback had gone from eighth on the depth chart to Jim McMahon's backup. Steve surprised everyone with his golden arm, and he could run like no quarterback had ever run before. He could make something out of nothing. His scramble ability, uh, be able to think on his feet, you don't teach that kind of thing. As a senior, Steve led BYU on an 11 game winning streak. He would replace Jim McMahon and by his senior year, he broke many NCAA records. When I think of Steve, I just think of the uh, of a guy that uh, just took what he had, maximized his abilities to the fullest, and overcame a lot of obstacles to accomplish what he did. Head coach Lavelle Edwards is one of college football's foremost teachers of the pro-style passing attack. Under his leadership, the Brigham Young Cougars led the nation in passing offense eight times. When he retired after the 2000 season, Cougar Stadium, with press boxes so immaculate, they're nicknamed the Provo Marriott by the media, was renamed Lavelle Edwards Stadium in his honor. During the Holiday Bowl against Missouri, that a receiver coach sent in a harrowing play that had everyone shaking their heads in amazement. I think he pitched it to the, to the running back going to the right. And then he drifted to the left. 51,000 plus here. Brigham Young with the ball. First down. Back to throw. Play flicker. In my opinion, could have won the Heisman Trophy. It's headed for Young. At the 15. At the 10. At the 5. And then through the pass, Steve going out to the left.
possible play, and Brigham Young has done it again. And the team finished the season with a victory in the Holiday Bowl, beating Missouri 21-17. Young was a Heisman Trophy finalist. Brigham Young makes a habit of producing great quarterbacks, but many of the experts say Steve is the best effort BYU. He was consensus All-American and placed second in the Heisman Trophy voting. He received the Davy O'Brien Award as the nation's most outstanding quarterback. His great-great-great-granddaddy was the Brigham Young. No wonder he made the team. He knows the owner. <laughs> he would be the number one draft pick in professional football. The LA Express of the fledgling USFL wanted to sign Steve to a $40 million lifetime contract. But as super agent Lee Steinberg tells Joe Fonzi, that was Steve's dream come true and his worst nightmare all rolled into one. Didn't want to play in the USFL. All he ever wanted to do was play in the NFL. He'd had Roger Staubach's picture over his bed. And so he just said, tell him no, Lee. So that's a simple negotiating technique. Even I can master that one. So I kept saying, no, no, no. Every time I said no, Don Klosterman increased the package. And it kept going up. It was $10 million, 15, 20, 25, 30. All of a sudden, we're at $40 million for four years. And oh my goodness. Until he is old and gray, uh, he's got security simply from playing for four years. And I think that's a crucial and a critical factor. Before the ink was dry on his contract, everybody was talking about the $40 million man. It is the $40 million contract signed by BYU's All-American quarterback Steve Young with the Los Angeles Express of the USFL. It was major news. It was even covered by one very young, familiar face. The USFL has quite a few kinks to work out, but they are certainly making news with their off-the-field spending habits today. Steve Young gets to wear the crown as richest athlete in history. Here are the highest salaried athletes. The way it was portrayed, it made it seem like sports is going crazy in the wrong direction and I'm now the face of it. It was a rough time. First question that most fans want to know, how, how have you reacted to the amount of money that uh, from one day to the next day being a multi-millionaire, how does it affect you and the people around you? Well, I think it's really difficult. I'm, I think I'm a pretty sensitive person to those kind of things, and uh, uh, it was very, you know, still tough to try to react to it. And um, the only way I can even find a way to, to feel good about it is to feel like I can go ahead and, and help a lot of other people this way. I hope to fix up my car and, and be able to uh, take my girl, <laughs> take my girlfriend out to dinner. He's not just a quarterback in the technician sense. He's an outstanding athlete. This is a guy who was one of the fastest players on his team and had over 100 yards rushing in some games in which he passed for three or 400 yards. The pressure to perform is always great on a quarterback because uh, win or lose, so you're, you're going to either give maybe too much credit or too much blame. And the amount of money you make, maybe the highest paid guy in, in professional sports possibly. That's got to be a lot more pressure on you to perform <laughs> and to do it real fast. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of pressure, and I think um, uh, in a lot of ways it's, you know, uh, overwhelming. You know, of course, about the contract that Steve Young signed on this past Monday with the Los Angeles Express, 43 years in duration, a total of $40 million, a fascinating financial structure. The Steve Young deal jolted more than just football fans. When a guy previously unheard of outside sports circles gets paid that much, it's staggering news. Unlike some other quarterbacks who are sheer technicians, this is a terrific athlete. In addition to being an outstanding technician, Gil Brandt of the Dallas Cowboys was quoted this past fall of, as calling Steve Young the most accurate passer he'd ever seen. The ball at the 15-yard line. First down, Steve Young gets his hands on the ball for the first time. Even as the check sat uncashed, Steve focused on playing the best football he could. In his first season with the Express, Steve became the first player in pro football history to rush for 100 yards and pass for 300, all in the same game. The biggest adjustment been from college to pro football. Uh, it's a lot more serious than professional football in the sense that uh, you get paid for it, and people know that and, re and respond in a, in a different way. Steve Young was worth the investment. He became the first pro quarterback 
to throw for 300 yards and rush for 100 in the same game. Passing excellence, but this young man can run with the football as well. He tossed for over 300 yards last week against Chicago, but look at this. He scores on this run. He ran for 120 yards last week. You're still very new to pro football, and yet as you look down the road into your future, what are your long-range goals? I think um, ultimately to uh, uh, bring this team to a point where it's um, uh, reach this potential as far as talent wise people stop talking about the potential that we have and and bring it to a point where we've reached it um i don't know how you'll ever measure that but there was growing concern that the league wasn't living up to its pro football status and worse yet it wasn't going to survive another season they announced that the league was going to fold it was unfortunate because the football the football was better in la than when i got to tampa bay it was just this side of a high school game because we could walk up and down the sidelines. I mean, I think we could have interviewed people during the game if we wanted to. And Lee Steinberg's walking up and down the sidelines. And he said, uh, this kid here, this Steve Young, you got to see him. Young headed to the NFL with only a fraction of the $40 million he originally was supposed to receive. And they had really one of the worst offenses, offensive lines and supporting cast maybe in the history of football. I would played for the Buccaneers at, when there were fights in the locker room and it was just, it was an awful, awful situation to play football in. And it, football is the ultimate team game and we were showing everyone in the world how you don't do it. He threw nearly twice as many interceptions as touchdowns. And after the 1986 season, the Bucks wanted a new quarterback. For Steve Young, Tampa Bay turned out to be a nightmare. When the Bucks had first pick in the 87 draft and had their eyes set on Miami quarterback Vinny Testaverde, Tampa Bay owner Hugh Culverhouse granted Steve one wish. And so I quickly called Hugh Culverhouse, the owner of the team, to be dealt to the 49ers. When Tampa owner Hugh Culverhouse was interested in trading Steve Young, Eddie took the call. He said, let's talk about trading him. He's not in the right place at the right time. He said, he's the best athlete that I've ever seen, which I totally agree with. He said he could play running back, he can play defensive back. But more important than that, he said, you'd want your daughter to marry him. Yeah, the franchise at that time was horrible, stayed horrible for years, and so now here he is, he's gone from the LA Express, which is a, just a monstrous situation, now he goes to one of the teams regarded as among the absolute worst in football, and he's trying to make something of that, and he's probably thinking at that point, am I ever going to be rescued? Is there any way that this is ever going to turn around for me? I'd rather do a lot of other things than play football under those conditions. A moment of disappointment turns into the chance of a lifetime. Time and tide would deliver Steve Young to his ultimate destination, where he was about to come face to face with the deity. And so then the negotiations got very, very serious. And we dickered a little bit, and it, it ended up at a, at a second, a fourth, and a million dollars. Walsh traded for promising quarterback Steve Young, who had been suffering with the woeful bucks. On April 24th, 1987, it was official. Steve Young was a San Francisco 49er. By the mid-80s, Joe Montana not only owned the city of San Francisco, but also two Super Bowl rings. Then trouble started brewing by the bay. You gotta give me a chance to find some place that could really kind of take advantage of my skills. Please don't let this happen. He nixed the trade. Three, two, two and a half, yeah. That's when Bill Walsh showed up. But I had to give him, I had to give back one to get into the NFL to buy my way out of the contract. Because I didn't want to wait five months, I wanted to play. The big picture was, this is the place I know that if I hang around long enough, I'll find out how good I can get. If I was gonna be a great player, if I was gonna actually, let's see how good you can get, this is where I found out. The reason why I had no doubts about coming was Bill said he's had second back surgery, Steve, and he will not recover from it. I was at BYU, he worked me out, and we worked hard, and he and I, th I threw for a while for him. And uh, at the end, he said, look, I think we're gonna make this trade. 
Following some very discouraging years with the LA Express and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Steve was traded to the San Francisco 49ers, where he would be the backup to one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. In 1987, Steve Young and Mike Holmgren were reunited in San Francisco, where Young faced yet another challenge. The only problem for Young was that San Francisco already had a quarterback. Being second on the depth chart behind Joe Montana. Joe Montana was an icon in San Francisco when Young arrived in 1987. Pretty, pretty. My first thought is, he's, he's not hurt at all. When you were deciding that you, well, we're going to leave Tampa Bay, you were going to get traded, and you and your agent Lee Steinberg were talking to Bill Walsh, the head coach of the 49ers. He says, Steve, don't worry. Joe Montana's never going to play again. Meanwhile, he goes on to win two more MVPs. You guys, he plays for five more years. Young stayed on the sideline while Montana won two more Super Bowls. Hmm. That was a good one. If you knew at that time what you eventually figured out, would you have asked to be traded somewhere else? Yes. If he would have said, look, Joe's going to play for a little while. We'd like you to come learn. I can't watch. You could almost see the drool coming out of Steve's mouth saying, I want to be there, I want to do this, and he pushed hard. In the movie Shawshank Redemption, Andy Dufresne is a banker who spends 19 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. There's a side of him, like a lot of really bright guys, that he really thinks he knows how to do it better than his coach does. All the other inmates do belong there, and Dufresne is an obvious misfit. If you want to talk to someone who wants to play, come talk to me. Steve was positive he was the best quarterback with our team from the day he got there. I also related to Dufresne's struggle. I knew that I couldn't watch, and I knew that I would go crazy watching. So either I'd find a place to play, or I'll go to law school, I'll do something else. I often looked around the NFL and felt different from everybody else. I knew that about myself. I'm going to go play, or I'm going to go to law school. So finally he has a chance to play, and who's in front of him, but maybe the greatest quarterback of all time, so. It's hard to replace the starter when he's winning league MVPs and Super Bowls. Most people in San Francisco think that professional football was invented in 1981. Come out of the dugout, there's always a one guy sitting there and he's screaming, we need Joe Montana. Looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass, caught by Clark. You can't be so what were the 49ers before Joe? When he came to town, he made winners out of us. And he was also pretty darn cute. <laughs> we were at home for the final game of the regular season. We want Joe! We want Joe! Growing up in San Francisco, this was Joe Montana City. They didn't want to accept Steve Young. We want Joe! Joe Montana's probably the toughest competitor that I've ever been around. I saw Joe do things that, to this day, I've never seen any other human being do on the field. What a play by Montana! People don't realize Joe Montana is a very tough competitor. Obviously, Montana had the skins on the wall to justify, okay, cool it, dude, you know, I'm in charge. Using a tiny rock hammer, he spends 19 years chipping away at a tunnel that he eventually crawls through to reach freedom. 86, 87, he's getting hurt. The Giants knocked him out of the playoff game. Joe is hurt. Steve's at quarterback. Two minutes to play in the game. 49ers are down by four points, and he takes off on a run that is still the best run by a quarterback I have ever seen. Joe Montana, after two Super Bowls, may be needing heat on him. This was the old phrase, creative tension. You got a young guy pushing you in town now, Steve Young. He's had some success on the team. Gets away again! Tell me about your relationship with Steve. We both respect each other's ability, and uh, but yet we're friends about it. I have to help him, he has to help me. And so he asked me to come over for Christmas dinner. When you went to Montana's house for dinner? Back then I was single, so I was like, everyone knew, yeah, let's help Steve out. And so it was really cool of him to do. <laughs> and I remember sitting at the table, and I don't know which son it was. He goes, Dad, wait. Isn't this a guy we're supposed to hate? Maybe that's where your kids thought that Montana tried to poison you. We're going to have to select between Steve Young and Joe Montana. It wasn't accidental. Bill did nothing by accident. If Joe's playing, it could support him 100%, make sure that we win. If I'm playing, prepare myself the best I possibly can. Just as there will always be fleas on dogs, there will be a quarterback controversy somewhere in the NFL. 
Well, our strength is a quarterback, but our problem is we have two, and there's a quarterback controversy developing. I think everybody was caught off guard by the quarterback controversy. Took a lot of heat off of that situation for himself. Could have been a smoke screen. When you talk about Bill, it's not an e easy story. He was doing that for a specific purpose. There's a quarterback controversy developing. The bills come from so many different places, you're never quite sure. Most coaches avoid a quarterback controversy at all costs. A rare occurrence where you see Joe Montana lifted for the game. Joe can throw the ball, or Steve can throw the ball on time to uh, Jerry without a problem. I call it creative tension. There were moments Bill would say, I'm not really sure who's going to be the quarterback. He would create creative tension amongst the players, a sense of insecurity around your job. Before Steve got there, I don't think Joe felt that kind of pressure at all. He was angry. They're both very competitive. Neither wishes to be pulled from a game. Bill started just putting out of nowhere. He's like, look, I'm, Joe, I'm going to put Steve in today. <laughs> Joe's like, what? And you could see Joe just... Joe had a knife, it was, you know, it'd been a problem, you know. Now Bill Wall says that doesn't mean Joe Montana's out of this game. He's not gonna start. Steve Young is gonna start. Joe, I'm playing Steve today. No, this is Joe Montana, right? Steve's got a set of plays, and and well, I'm gonna put him in, so just know that's coming. I resented Bill for putting me into games when we were behind and it was too late to catch up. Joe resented Bill every time he got pulled. I was talking to Montana yesterday, and he said he feels fine, and he's disappointed that he's not starting today. He loved creative tension. He got to play it all. It was just a mop-up, hand the ball off, you know, and he, he was pretty discouraged. He'd come back and he'd go home alone. He didn't, I didn't, I mean, he was really discouraged. He's ticked off. Montana's ticked off. Bill Walsh were to say to you, Joe, it's time to hang it up. Would you play somewhere else? Yes. That's a very frustrating quarterback right there. I didn't want to be pulled. I didn't like being pulled. A rare occurrence where you see Joe Montana lifted from the game. I always felt that no matter what, we can come back from a deficit with our team. I mean, all that was orchestrated to me. I mean, there is, it was orchestrated because he wanted to find, he wanted to see what they were made of. Hustle, 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 hustle! What Bill was thinking, what I'm going to get out of this, is the best of Joe Montana and Steve Young. The embattled genius played Montana and Young against each other. You gotta be able to put plays together without tripping, without throwing interception, all right? Let's put it together. Joe's the king, and I'm hanging around trying to take that job. I mean, that's some heady stuff. And they're both fighting for the same thing. I give Joe a ton of credit because despite all of the angst around it, we never had a crossword. We played tons of golf together. But over the next six years, their competition for the starting job drove them further and further apart. In 1991, with Joe Montana injured, Steve Young shed his role of supporting actor. To Steve's credit, when it came his time to play, he was ready. When injury sidelined Montana in 1991 and 92, Young stepped in and led the league in passing. And became the leading man in San Francisco. He got there! Oh, what a banana! When Young finally replaced an injured Montana in the early 90s, 49er fans didn't like the change. It wasn't like, we don't like Steve. It was more for the, the memory of those four Super Bowls. We love Montana! Walsh rocked a coaches meeting by proposing the unimaginable. He said, what do you think we could get if we traded Joe Montana? I wanted to tell Joe, Joe, I didn't know, or I wouldn't have put, put us in this bind. And then he passed out pieces of paper, goes write down what you would take in a trade for Joe Montana. For four long years, Steve sat back in the shadow of Joe Montana. No one said anything. No one wanted to do it. We went around the room again. Of course, it was no, 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 no. I'm not a quarterback. I'm not a center no more. How's that? At that point, the blood was so bad after the 92 season, Joe had to go, and hence he was traded to Kansas City. Prior to the 1993 season, Montana was traded to Kansas City. 
In 1993, the 49ers made the choice that Young would be their quarterback. And they traded the 37-year-old Montana to Kansas City. For me, just getting through that tunnel and getting out really was a freeing feeling. There's a huge, huge weight lifted off from now that Montana's not there anymore. Montana still believed he was the better quarterback. And one year later, he would get his chance to prove it. The 49ers had a great quarterback in Steve Young, but every 49er fan's worst nightmare. Joe Montana's gone, and he's thriving in Kansas City. If Steve Young was going to reach the top of the football world in 1994, he was going to have to start his climb at rock bottom. After years of butting heads, our number seven feuders went head to head in 1994. Everybody had it marked down as Joe versus Steve. It was two good teams, two playoff teams that year. It was week two of the 1994 season, but the emotions of the first Joe Montana versus Steve Young showdown were obvious. Joe and Steve did not like each other very much. There was not a lot of love lost uh, between the two. There was no question that Joe Montana wanted to beat the 49ers, and I think it was the icing on the cake that Steve Young was the quarterback. Of course, he wanted to crush him. Montana always saw Young as a threat, a threat who needed to be expunged. Joe Montana had played in many big games. We got Joe! We got Joe! He was playing against the team he led to four world championships and against the man who replaced him. High formation play fake by Montana, wants to throw wide open. Joe Valerio has a touchdown! I think you can see it in that reaction. He wants his win today. The truth was nothing was going to change in my life substantially. And I learned this because I won the MVP twice. Nothing's going to change it until you win the Super Bowl. Back to throw is Montana. Fires for the end zone. Deep catch. Touchdown, Kansas City! I really respect Steve for the way that he handled himself because if you talk to Steve, he'll talk about learning the quarterback position through watching Joe. He would rank that victory maybe even the equal of anything he did in the Super Bowl. This is a tremendous opportunity being taught by one of the greatest coaches of all time, one of the greatest players of all time, by a series of players that are going to be Hall of Fame players. You're going to train to be great. To follow in the legend's footsteps. For Steve Young, for a long time, the knock on him was that he can't win the big one. On his list, I got to think outside of a winning a championship game, that one might have felt pretty good. <laughs> My feeling for Joe is I'm in awe of Joe Montana. I was like, no one can do that. No human being can do what I saw him do. This game means so much to Joe Montana. Yeah, I mean, he can play it down and not yeah. talk, but I know Joe Montana. Without a Super Bowl, we, we like you. You can hang around, but we don't love you, and we don't want you to stay too long. Anything less than a Super Bowl really wasn't that interesting. I found that out in 1992 when I was the MVP of the league, and that MVP trophy, honestly, I don't think it would have got me a gallon of gas. Until Steve Young won a Super Bowl, Joe still owned that town. Montana, he's still the best, and he always will be. That was the way it was. It was the way Joe built it. They'd had four of them, and we needed one, and I needed one. They won the Super Bowl there. They only lost three games. One of the games they lost was at Arrowhead to Joe Montana. I was making something miserable and difficult that was one of the most pure, wonderful opportunities that someone could ever have. And though they're among the best quarterbacks ever, to this day, they'll never be best of friends. Succeeding a legend is no picnic. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. But it's also the best thing that has ever happened to me. Even now, there have been a couple of events at 49er games, and if Young's there, Montana isn't. And I don't think that's coincidental. My favorite NFL player when I was growing up was uh, probably had to be Steve Young. The rush is on for starting lineup. Now there's an official collection of NFL heroes. <laughs> you wanted one. Believe me, as a player, it's like having your own football card. Good calves and thighs, though. That's good. <laughs> you wanted to be in the starting lineup lineup when these things came out. No, I can guarantee you you'll never find a picture with me Anywhere in existence with a half shirt like that. That's that's a concoction. Swips the ball. Oh, he's in trouble. Still has it. Finds an open receiver. The catch made. 99% of the quarterbacks in the league go down there. Steve Young, one of the courageous games 
I've ever seen in a pro football player's career. The young will run. He's got the whole field. Here's Steve Young. Battling touchdown. Steve did it more with like blood and guts. Battling touchdown. On any given Sunday, Steve Young gave us all a reason to love the game. Young the throw, runs away to his left, has some space, he's got lots of room, stays in bounds, he's in the 20! Steve Young played with incredible courage and determination. 15, one man to get by, he's in the five, carries him into the end zone, oh what a play! His passion for winning and fiery competitive spirit made for some of the most exciting moments in football and an athlete doing things no quarterback had ever done. Quintessential Steve Young play. It's got to be his run versus the Vikings. Everyone says that for a reason. And we call a little three-step drop. Yeah. In trouble. He's going to be sacked. No, gets away. He runs. Gets away again. Goes to the 40. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Gets away again. Gets away again. Gets away again. Gets away again. Does it 35. Does it 35. Cuts back at the 30. Cuts back at the 30. I really think the key to speed is just desire. Cuts back at the 30. Oh, score. Turn it 20. Turn it 20. The 50. The 50. Speed will forever remain the greatest challenge in the world of sport. The 50. as Steve became Hall of Fame and all that stuff, he had to discipline himself as a thrower. Rice to the left, Young. Looks right in the end zone, caught, Terrell Owens. I can't rely on using my legs to get out of this all the time. Steve Young set a franchise record with 35 touchdown passes. Remember when Steve Young's career ended, he was the number one rated quarterback in NFL history. His quarterback rating was the highest in NFL history, topping the mark set by Joe Montana. You know, you coach him, but he kind of figured these things out for himself. Young learned to beat teams with his legs and his arm. During a 10-game win streak, he accounted for 29 touchdowns and threw just four interceptions. At that moment, it starts at its greatest form uh, because that's kind of football. You kind of see it, you kind of have an idea. The great thing about Steve Young was his ability to perform in the clutch a lot more than people thought he did. And now he throws for the end zone, and he's got Owens, and he catches the ball! The Detroit game is exactly what I'm talking about with his physical toughness. Steve Young is hurt. Oh, my, is he ever. Again, I don't know if he can get up from this one. Young will stroll. And there is a very memorable image of him crawling off the field. I thought he was going to die. You know, it's, it's very inspiring. And uh, you learn a lot of things. And what does he do? He comes running back into the huddle. You could see the teammates get lifted up by his toughness. And he led them to a comeback win in the fourth quarter. You know, he told us, you know, so many things, how to run the offense, how to, how to run a two-minute drill, when to get rid of the ball, when not to get rid of the ball. Here's the ball game. Young under pressure. Gets it away. Ball is caught. Into the end zone. Touchdown. Make plays, you know, is the most important thing. And it, it was just exciting just sitting there listening. I'm like, this is a guy that I idolized growing up, and he's sitting here now telling me, you know, what I can do to better myself. In the third quarter, with the game out of reach and Young being slammed to the turf on every play, Coach George Seifert changed quarterbacks in the middle of a series. And Gerback is going in the game for Steve Young right now. How about that? I don't know. I, I bet you Steve doesn't like it. How about that? I don't know. I, I bet you Steve doesn't like it. I think his coach get worried about him. And with the score 33-8, the way he's getting hit, who can blame him? I felt like he was saying, yeah, everyone got beat up, but you, you are, it's your fault. And I went out of the sidelines, and I was looking for a fist fight. He and I were going to fight, and we're going to fight right there. And I wouldn't stop. 
So I started saying things and emoting things that I'm surprised that he didn't turn around and fight me. For all the crap that I'd been through for all those years, and you're gonna trot the quarterback out, these remnant feelings, like I, I had PTSD from the old days, you know? And so I just lo I lost my mind. I mean, trot someone else out with him, then trot out, you know, J.J. Stokes to take Jerry's place. I've never seen him like I, this. I mean, you know, everyone is trying to calm him down, and he's just not buying it. Trying to calm him down, and he's just not buying it. And good for George for just not paying attention, because, I mean, most human beings would react. He's saying to Brent Jones, he said, do you believe that? After the game, I remember talking to him, I said, bro. What's your problem? My sideline outburst was a result of lots of pent-up frustration, stretching back years. The funny thing about the whole event, from my teammate's standpoint, was suddenly I was this fiery leader. For me, it was cathartic. But for my teammates, it was revelatory. But really, it kind of galvanized the guys behind Steve. There was a lot of guys that said, hey, wait a second. This guy's got some fight to him. This taught me a vital lesson. Perception is reality. I, I wanted to go home and throw up and think about, are you kidding me? For all these years I've been out here battling and I had to yell at my coach and now you're like ready to follow me? I had played at full throttle my entire career, but it wasn't until I screamed at my head coach that I became a fiery leader that everyone wanted to rally behind. But it taught me a, a, the, the vital lesson of football. Perception is reality. I had worked hard my entire career to establish myself as a leader. But I wasn't a leader until I was perceived as one. If you're perceived to be something, you might as well be it because that's the truth in people's minds. The reality was that after he exploded at Seifert, Young played the quarterback position at a level few had ever seen. Young has been absolutely perfect. Steve, uh, he was known as, as a runner, and he wanted to prove to everybody that I can stand back there in the pocket and, and I can be a precise passer. You learn to pass first and then think to run because, after all, I have Jerry Rice out there. I don't want to take the ball out of his hands. Quick plan at Jerry Rice. Head dog. Touchdown, 49ers. Throws right open. Touchdown. After serving as Montana's understudy for four seasons, Young finally got his chance at greatness. Uh, my last grand coaching game in Green Bay. At that point, he had never beaten Brett Favre or the Packers, period. How many 100-yard rushing games do you have? I don't know. I don't know, but too many. I can tell the you. I mean, is, I had. The problem is too zero. many. Zero. But the pro <laughs> but there's, that's, there's too many. When you can't remember how many. Favre had just put the Packers ahead. And now here he starts inside. Darnell Walker jumps that slant. And once he jumped it, Antonio Freeman just wheeled and went the other way. That's it. The Packers with in field goal. Now the 49ers have to think touchdown. Three man front. Young fires. Stokes has it open first down. Young. Chase throws. Edwards broke away from one tackle and another. Young pump fake to the outside. It's the Kirby. Line of scrimmage to the 33 yard line. Young stands in the pocket, gets it to Garrison Hurst, and Hurst gets to the Green Bay 25. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. If you want to take one crack, maybe he's the guy you should go for. Three man right. He slips. He looks like he's falling down. He keeps his balance. Young almost falls down. Throws to the end zone. Throws to the end zone. And Young stumbles on the way back and fires up the middle. Oh! made the catch. The ball had to be perfect. It was somehow. He just real quiet. Are you serious? They hate to love me. That scoring drive took him nine plays, 76 yards, a minute and 53 seconds. Niners will win it. Niners will win it. In the divisional playoff game, the ultimate dual threat quarterback led his team to a rout of the Bears. The 49ers spent an entire year waiting for this game, this opponent, and this moment.
like San Francisco to be the best team in football this year, to beat Dallas in one of the best NFC championship games of all time. If you're going to find out, you're going to find out against the best. And I remember going up to Drakeman in warm-ups, like, Troy, thanks for coming, man. It's great to see you. And Troy's like, yeah, thanks for coming, too. And then to go to the Super Bowl and to beat San Diego in a lopsided Super Bowl. Who gives a shit? <laughs>
baby voice of the Chargers, but I'll tell you, this is a joy to watch. This is one of the greatest offenses I think modern day football has ever seen. When heroes are born, legends are made, and ghosts are laid to rest. Someone take the monkey off my back, please! No. So now he doesn't have to be compared to Joe Montana anymore. <laughs> I was having fun, and everyone was talking about my monkey on my back for so many years. It was like, seemed funny. And I regret it, because it sent the wrong message for how I looked. I think it's a metaphor for a lot of people. Even now, people will say, hey, you got a load of monkey off your back. 49ers win the game, and I think that really did a, a lot for Steve Young's ability to be considered a clutch performer. Getting the monkey off? How many years am I going to put up with that? Huh? When you're talking about the day six interception thing at BYU, or is having to sit on the bench a little bit in San Francisco. Now go see how good you can get. It actually worked out. And he hit these points in his career where it wasn't what he thought it should be. He did something about it. I got to see how good I could get. It was a tremendous opportunity, not like, oh, huh. The burden's lifted, and that is what, I think that's why I, I feel the way I do. He decided, this isn't what I wanted. I want this, and he went and got it. I mean, Young throwing six touchdown passes, Jerry catching three touchdown passes. I mean, that cemented their place in football history. So when he's holding that Super Bowl trophy, the elation, just the fantastic feeling you get from reaching the top of the mountain, you could see it. Hey, you deserve that. Hey. Hold on to a tight. This is it. No more. You know what? I get, I get 24 hours of quiet, and hey, you need to sit down. For Steve Young to fill those shoes and to make those shoes his own? <laughs> what? What are you going to do? I'm a Super Bowl champion. Just sit down. And relax. For Steve Young, there were no more critics and no more questions. With his performance in Super Bowl 29, he took his place alongside the greatest big game quarterbacks in NFL history. Everyone in this room made a commitment, and we're there, and no one can ever, ever take it away from us, ever! <laughs>
doing? Old. <laughs> no. <laughs> Broken down. Good. It happens. A young guy can come in. It feels like it. the locker room would respond better to that. But after yesterday, I think it's a little bit more muddled, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I agree. That locker room is a tricky, tricky dynamic. Steve Young, very critical of how the Denver Broncos are using Tim Tebow. Listen. Personally, I think it's embarrassing. This is just a gimmick, and I think it takes away from the possibility, any possibility, that Tim can develop into an NFL quarterback. But in the long run, Tim Tebow believes he's an NFL quarterback. That's the deal he made with the Broncos. He said it well. He sure did. Talk about whether or not you believe he's right. I thought it was right on the money, and I applaud Steve Young for saying it because I'm with Steve. It's embarrassing what they're doing to Tim Tebow. I want to go to Steve Young's comments. First, I agree the offense he's talking about is not sustainable. The worst place you can stick Tim Tebow is in a slowdown under, under center offense with no weapons around him. If he runs that much, he'll get broken up. I know he's big. I know he's tough and all that. But he will get broken up. I think that's why one reason quarterbacks don't run a ton in the NFL. I took the liberty of looking up Steve Young's stats. This is a dude that's passed for 33,000 yards in his career. The year is 1989. I'm going to start there. Start there. 69%. Uh. 61, 64, 66, 68, 70, I was 66. There. 67, 67, 62% yep. of his passes. Now go From 1989 to 1998, this dude easily threw in the mid-60 percentile in terms of completion. And you're going to tell me he had a similar reputation to Tim Tebow, who completed 46% of his passes yeah, uh, last year? Passer. What? Yeah. What are you sniffing? Jerry Rice broke Jim Brown's league record of 126 touchdowns. Young throws downfield, Jerry Rice, he's got it! The Steve Young-Jerry Rice connection, in terms of numbers, um, exceeded what Jerry did with Joe. They threw far more touchdowns than Montana to Rice, so wrap your brain around that for starters. In all, Young threw 85 touchdowns to Rice, 30 more than his predecessor. No! The relationship was was almost magical in some regards. During their 13 seasons together, Young and Rice built a rapport that surpassed the traditional quarterback-receiver relationship. Steve and Jerry developed such a chemistry and a timing about themselves that even when people were doubling Jerry Rice, they would find a way to connect. Going back the other way. Why was everybody trying to set you up on a date? Couldn't you do things on your own? <laughs> no, I was struggling. Bro. It's a little chilly, isn't it, Steve? Oh, sorry. What am I thinking? How's that? Hey, thank you. Yeah. Warm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown 49ers! Jerry Rice is the touchdown scorer of the century. I just had it in my mind that I wanted to retire a 49er. It meant so much to me. I felt awkward going somewhere else. That was the bottom line. In June, when I finally decided, it was like, okay, I am retiring a 49er. Let's do it in the locker room. That's what I'm doing. Young supporters will tell you Steve would have won another ring or two had it not been for those 90s Cowboys and Packers teams. I have learned the tough lessons of humility and patience. The pressure to perform taught me some of the greatest lessons of my life. Two-time MVP, four-time All-Pro, seven-time Pro Bowler. Holds the all-time record for passer rating. Holds the all-time Super Bowl record for touchdown passes in a game with six in Super Bowl 29. And in 2005, he will be a Hall of Famer. When he's not wrestling with wagon trains, is to create the bronze sculptures of Hall of Fame inductees. And he got that assignment thanks to Coach Bill Walsh. He was a guest speaker. He'd won the first Super Bowl with the 49ers, and he was a guest speaker at the Cougar Club Banquet, sports banquet at BYU at the end of the year. So he came up after and 
asked me, he says, would you consider doing something for me? I'm looking for something to give to Eddie DeBartolo, if he doesn't already have, um, something unique. Would you consider doing a sculpture of us? Uh, and I, after he picked me up off the ground, I said, sure. So they flew me back to Youngstown to give Eddie his copy. And while I was back there, they called up the Hall of Fame and said, you need to see this guy's work. I went over, met with the directors, and they hired me. So I've been doing it since 1983. How are you doing? Congrats, Good. man. Congrats. Good man. Congratulations. Buswell's carved many a famous sports figure, but this year is special. It'll be unique in that, uh, you know, uh, being a teammate, uh, being a friend, and after doing this for all this time, I get to be a part of that induction of someone I know rather than someone I just met. So I was kind of preparing myself that this is, uh, this is going to happen. I'm looking forward to this. The way I do it, they either come to me here or I go to their home. You know, football's not a lone game. It's not golf. I mean, you got to find guys that want to play and win. you got to find a coach that understands and has to put you in a good spot. you got to find an owner that wants to bring people in and put them together right. And uh, we spend a day or two together and I go concentrate on getting the likeness uh, what, where they feel comfortable, what expression they want, and to make sure that on induction day when the, when the cloth is pulled, they're not going to say, well, who is that? And all their friends and family are there. Blair's done a pretty decent job so far, so much so that he was named the number one sports artist in the country. You thought to yourself, if I can hang in there and play 12, 15 years here, that you know you can you, you, there's, the sky's the limit on what you can accomplish. His Hall of Fame bus can take up to seven months to complete. He begins work on the clay sculpture first and following revisions and final approval from the Hall of Famers themselves the images are cast in bronze. I'm in the midst of uh, I, you know I played in, in uh, the USFL which is actually pretty good football and no matter how you look at it it was a pretty good football and I was coached by Sid Gilman. Blair Buswell always had a feeling he would someday be sculpting a bus for his friend Steve Young. He was full of it. I mean, he had it all. And he unloaded it on me. And in mm. two years, I gathered as much as I was ever going to need, probably, to figure out how to play quarterback. Capturing his image and freezing a moment in bronze to rest in Canton in perpetuity. He used to go out and drill me with whistles and ropes. And <laughs> I mean, I was just I, literally, you know, he was going to make something out of me. His ability, uh, just the character of who he is, solid guy. I had great training at BYU, so despite the fact that it looked like a strange way to get in, I had been shepherded so perfectly in a way to be a, a very good quarterback because at BYU, you were going to throw the ball a bunch, you were going to drop back and make reads, you had to deliver it on time. I kept teasing him along the way when we'd run into each other at different events or uh, at the Pro Bowl or you know around. I'd say, well, if you keep this stuff up, Steve, we're going to spend some time together. You're going to be in the Hall of Fame, and he just, you know, we had a good laugh, and uh, but it came true. I am honored to join your ranks today, and more importantly, I stand to honor those in my life who made it possible. Thank you very much. I like it. I'm a little taller. That's good. When he took that field, all hell broke loose. He liberated a whole new generation of quarterbacks. I mean, nobody plays a game like Steve Young. And to say that, well, you know, we're going to look for another Steve Young, lots of luck. He was the smartest quarterback ever to play football, disregarding what he knew about football. Yeah, he was a great quarterback and absolutely Hall of Fame. The football statistics will speak for themselves, but his legacy really is he was a good guy. And he likes being a good guy. He's learned a lot. I knew, I, I say that because I've seen where he's come from and uh, I'm real proud of him. A backup to one of the all-time greats, and yet here you are as a Hall of Famer because of what you were able to accomplish after all of that. Learn from Joe Montana. Prepare to play for the San Francisco 49ers in the glory years. Go out there and find out how good you are. There's no position like it in sports to be a quarterback in the pocket trying to find a receiver with, you know, five guys bearing down on you. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Steve Young's Hall of Fame career included a higher career passer rating than any quarterback who preceded him. So really, what do you do? I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs>